All right, guys, today we're going to be talking about everything you need to know for preoperative risk assessment. So let's get started. The first point that everybody is going to be talking about when they're teaching you this subject is that we don't clear patients for surgery. Instead, we only provide an estimation of the perioperative risks and then make recommendations on ways to reduce or mitigate those risks. So when you're going into pre-op medicine, the biggest one that everybody's going to be you know, questioning is going to be cardiac risk assessment. And there's all these complicated graphs that really are just like an eyesore. Like there's so much stuff going on. And you know, this is up to date over here. They're very useful. I would review them, but I don't think they're really the best. And the best one that I found is actually one that was made by my my chief resident and was really a lot more clear than those ones. And so I'm going to take you first down the cardiac risk assessment pathway and kind of explain to you how we do a cardiac risk assessment. And then after that, we're going to be talking about hepatic, pulmonary, and medication management as well. So first of all, the first step that we need to define before we talk about cardiac risk assessment is the surgical urgency. And so there are four different surgical urgencies that we should know about. The first one is going to be emergent, and this is limb or life-threatening within six to 12 hours. So this is basically, you know, think about all the emergency uh, conditions like AAA rupture, neck fash, rupture neck topic. These patients need to go straight to the OR and they should not take any time doing a cardiac risk assessment. They should just go straight to the OR. Urgent is what we're going to most commonly see in the inpatient setting, and this is what we're most commonly going to be consulted for. And these are surgical procedures that really should be done within two to three days. Otherwise, there's an increased risk of morbidity and mortality if it's not done within two to three days. So that's going to include things like hip fractures and appendicitis. Time sensitive is the next uh, category, and this is when a delay of greater than one to six weeks would negatively affect the outcome. And this is going to be most of your oncologic surgeries, obviously, because you don't want the tumors to just be growing. Elective is the final category of surgical urgency, and they, these are procedures like joint replacements and cosmetic procedures that could easily be delayed greater than one year without negative outcomes. So now that we've described surgical urgency, let's kind of go down the pathway of cardiac risk assessment. I've always found that it's useful to draw things out for people, so it's a lot easier to read. So I'm just going to go through this step by step with you guys, and this should hopefully help you guys. So step number one is is this an emergency surgery? If the answer to that is yes, then the patient should go straight to the OR. And if the answer to that is no, then we're going to move on to step number two. And that is going to be, are there any active cardiac conditions? So the conditions we're going to be looking for here are going to be four conditions. So that's going to be acute coronary syndrome, decompensated heart failure, unstable arrhythmias, whether that's bradyarrhythmia or tachyarrhythmia, or severe valvular disease. Generally, aortic stenosis is going to be the one that we're most worried about. And if any of these are present, then we need to treat these conditions before we go to the OR. Now, if there are no active cardiac conditions, the next thing we do is we're going to do the cardiac risk calculators. So the ones you're going to hear about are going to be the GUPTA score, RCRI, or the Revised Cardiac Risk Index, or the NSQIP score. So here I've got the GUPTA score uh, as depicted here. These are the criteria that you input. And then the RCRI, the Revised Cardiac Risk Index, has these criteria. And then we have the NSQIP score, which is obviously a much bigger score. And so generally, we're going to be using the GUPTA and the RCRI score. The GUPTA tends to underpredict cardiac risk, and the RCRI tends to overpredict cardiac risk. And finally, we're not going to do the NSQIP score that often, but it's really useful for when you have a patient who has multiple things going on, and you really want to have a very granular detail of like specific complications that might happen. Because this one, instead of just giving you the cardiac risk score, will give you specific percentages is for how likely is it that they're going to discharge to a sniff or how likely is it that they're going to get pneumonia. So this can be useful when you're having a very difficult decision on whether a patient should go to surgery or not. So what we are looking for is a score of less than 1% risk of a major adverse cardiac event. So if that is less than 1%, then the patient is low cardiac risk and they can proceed to the OR. If it's greater than 1%, then we are going to have to do an additional step after that. So greater than 1%, then we move on to step four, which is going to be calculating the patient's functional capacity. And that's going to be using something called METs or metabolic equivalent tasks. And what we're looking for on the METs is looking for them to be able to complete greater than four METs. 
So if they can complete greater than four METs, then they can also go straight to the OR. And how do we calculate the number of METs? So there's two basically um, ways that we do this. The most common way is to just ask a patient if they can walk up a flight of stairs. If they can walk up a flight of stairs without having to stop, that is the equivalent of achieving greater than four METs. So that's one of the most common questions that we ask. Uh, but actually there is a more nuanced version of this that can give us a more accurate assessment of somebody's METs and also is uh, basically more, has more evidence behind it in, in terms of being accurate for calculating somebody's METs. And that's gonna be the Duke Activity Status Index score. And I'm just gonna pull that up here. It looks very, very bulky, uh, but really, you know, this, I really like this score. You just have to answer a few of these questions and you can get really a good idea of what a patient's METs are. So for example, I don't have to go through every single one of these questions to know what a patient's METs are. Let's say that the patient tells me that they're able to go and shop and get groceries for themselves like two blocks away or something. So even if I put, you know, this is kind of all stratified based on how difficult it is, more, most of the difficult tasks are further down. So is the patient able to participate in strenuous sports? Probably not. Recreational sports, sexual relations, yard work, heavy work around the house? Probably not but they are able to carry in groceries and vacuum and sweep floors. So that's gonna be a yes. They can do light work around the, the house. Uh, running a short distance, maybe not. Uh, maybe they can't climb a flight of stairs. Maybe that's a little bit too difficult for them. Uh, they can walk one to two blocks on level ground. They can walk indoors and they can take care of themselves. And you can see that this automatically is giving us 4.4 METs, even just knowing like a couple of details of their functional capacity. So this gives us a really, really nice granular way to figure out if a patient has four METs or not. So again, if they have greater than four METs, then they can go to the OR. And then if they have less than four METs, then we're gonna have to decide whether they're gonna have to do further cardiac stress testing. So step five at this point is going to be stress testing. Now the question you have to ask here is, is stress testing going to impact the decision to pursue surgery or not? If a patient is coming in for an urgent procedure that needs to be done in the next two to three days, then the results of a stress test, even if it's positive, is not going to affect your decision to go to the surgery. For example, say somebody breaks their hip and then they have greater than 1% cardiac risk, and then they have less than four METs, and you're deciding to do a cardiac stress test, well, the cardiac stress test comes back positive. What are you going to do about it? They're still going to need their surgery in two to three days. You're not going to go take this patient for a cabbage and get their coronary arteries bypassed. You're not going to place a stent in this patient, which would then warrant them to need six to 12 months of dual antiplatelet therapy, which cannot be held. So in that case, if it would not change management, then the patient, again, should be going to the OR. Now, if this would change management, well, then obviously you do a stress test. And if it is a normal stress test, then they can go to the OR. And if it's abnormal, then you're gonna have to treat before they get the procedure. So I just wanna say that if you are on an inpatient medicine consult team, a majority of the time, these patients are going to be coming in for urgent procedures. And so most of the time, they are not going to need uh, a stress test because it's not going to change the management. So even if you go through all these risk calculators, you're not going to, in the end, recommend stress testing. Uh, you're just going to say the patient is elevated risk. Stress testing would be indicated potentially, but it's not going to change management. So we're just going to tell the surgeons that there is elevated risk, but we wouldn't recommend stress testing in this case. All right, and that's it for the full algorithm of cardiac risk assessment. And once you do this several times, it becomes very easy and it's gonna become very like simple for you to do. It's, it's really not that big of a, a thing. So it's an emergency surgery, then go straight to the OR. Do they have any active cardiac conditions? If they do, then treat it. If not, then calculate the risk calculators. And if they're low risk, they can go straight to the OR. If they're high risk, but their functional capacity suggests greater than four METs, then they can also go to the OR. And then finally, if they are less than four METs, then you have to decide whether they need stress testing or not. And so most of the time, stress testing is really gonna only be indicated for kind of elective procedures, uh, maybe time sensitive ones where you could maybe do some medical management beforehand. But for like the urgent hip fractures coming in, you're not gonna recommend stress testing in those cases. Next question that frequently comes up is, is the patient going to need an echocardiogram? So this is a really great question. And a lot of times the surgeons are going to ask you, does this patient need an echo? And there's only four different scenarios in which you would recommend obtaining an echo uh, before surgery. And that is going to be known left ventricular dysfunction without a recent echo in the last year, known moderate or severe uh, aortic stenosis or aortic regurge 
with no echo in the past year. Suspicion for moderate to severe valvular stenosis or regurgitation. So this is, for example, if you go see the patient and you listen to their heart and all of a sudden you hear this huge murmur, then this would be an indication to get an echo before the surgery. And finally, the last indication is going to be dyspnea with no clear etiology and no prior echo. So just go down that checklist. If the patient meets any of those criteria, then recommend an echo before they go to surgery. Otherwise, the patient does not need an echo. So that was cardiac risk assessment as part of your preoperative risk evaluation and stratification. Next, we're going to be talking about hepatic, pulmonary, and delirium, as well as some other miscellaneous medical conditions. And then we're going to talk about perioperative medication management as well. So stay tuned for those videos. Click down on the link below or on the screen right after this to go to those videos. And I'll see you in the next video. Thanks. Peace.